it's difficult to read though because he doesn't write in the best style. <laughs> And I will unmute Generate. And on. Okay. Uh, Jared, can you can you speak? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. And perfect. For some reason, Tom is not unmuting for me. Um, now okay, I'm, so, Tom, you are now unmuted. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, welcome everybody. We'll we'll just wait a few minutes because um, people normally appear late. Indeed, there's another fourteen of them appearing late. And are we? Live on. I think we might be. So I'll just check to see if Jared, do you know if we are live on? Uh, it looks like it. On Facebook. Um, I, I think don't have a couple Facebook. of minutes. Seven people are waiting. Um, shall we wait two more minutes and then we can start at um, yeah. five minutes past that's our, our custom custom today? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm sharing the live feed to the Nunes Vaz family group right now, so <laughs> Okay. Many people there. Um, we're up to, we've got 68 now. Wow. That's good. Um, and I bring the crowds. What can I say? Yeah, indeed. Indeed you do. And we have four people, four people watching on Facebook, although I think two of those are Jarrett and myself, six people watching on Facebook. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, Ton, you're going to keep an eye on um, chat. Yes. That. Oh, Jarrett, Adam is saying hello to you. Adam Brown? Adam Brown. The, yep. the oh, hey, Adam Brown. You will be discussed a little later on in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> hey, be careful, he's got a low degree. Okay, 70, 73. And on, okay, so we're now up to 10 on uh, I'm sorry, everyone. It must be really irritating us looking at the numbers the whole time, but uh, it's uh, we yeah, uh, how we get our uh, kids. Ah. Mm -hmm. let's go. Okay, yeah, that's okay. Um, well, welcome. Everybody to our eighth, uh, I think it's our eighth meeting, isn't it? Yes, it's our eighth, eighth meeting. And um, today uh, we're very happy to, to, to welcome our, our friend uh, Jarrett Ross, who, as uh, some of you uh, will know, 
with uh, Ton, uh, Michael Wass, and myself is uh, one of the administrators of the uh, Sephardic Diaspora Group. Um, Jara has uh, a lot of experience, especially focused uh, on uh, DNA and uh, earlier than that, uh, researching the, the Nunez Vaz family. Amongst other things, he also has done a lot of work on, uh, on Ashkenazi uh, research. Um, so uh, just, just one or two uh, housekeeping things before uh, we start. This meeting is being uh, recorded, so if anybody doesn't want their image to appear, then please turn off your, uh, your, your video. I think most people probably won't appear. Um, I'd just like to, uh, to mention that um, Jarrett is, of course, well known also as, as, as the genie vlogger. And if you're not following him on, uh, on YouTube, then uh, please uh, do. I'd also like to give a shout out to the uh, Jewish Genealogical Society of Great Britain, which today has uh, launched its, uh, its uh, Twitter feed. I think it's called something like Jewish, Jewish Great, I think it's called. But anyway, you can, you can find that and sign up for that. So, um, yeah, sorry, the thing I, I, I forgot to tell you, Jarrah, uh, is, is can you move on to the second slide? And uh, yeah, so um, so Jarrett will um, talk for uh, probably a bit longer than normal. Um, yesterday, so Ton and I kept him when we were practicing and kept him yakking for about two hours. Um, and, and really, it's it's two 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 talks in one. I mean, the first one is is a uh, a masterclass in in how to do ge Jewish genealogy. And the second half is, is a, a useful introduction to, to DNA research. I mean, normally I'm afraid DNA just goes over my head, but Jara is, uh, is good at explaining that. Um, afterwards, um, we will have some questions. If you have any questions, then please uh, put them in the chat. Um, I think Ton, Ton will be monitoring, and if, if appropriate, he'll, he'll jump in. If not, we'll, we'll ask questions at the end. So um, enough from me, um, Jara, over to you. All right, thank you very much, David. Well, uh, welcome everybody. I am Jarrett Ross. Um, as David said, uh, you may know me as the Genie Vlogger from YouTube. Um, I actually work as the lead forensic uh, genealogist at DNA Labs International, where I literally solve crime using genetic genealogy. Uh, but I will be talking about the Nunes Vaz family today. Uh, and Today's presentation is called A Journey of Western Sephardic Genealogy, and we will be covering a lot of information, and all of it is specifically about the Nunes Vaz family. So starting out, just going to show off my pedigree. This is uh, my family tree showing all of my ancestors. But today, we're going to focus on this line. This is my Nunes Vaz line. Now, I just want to point out real quick, you may notice the numbers after my name and after all of the other names. This is a genealogical numbering system. It is a modified version of what's known as the Henry numbering system. And I think that it's very important to use these type of genealogical numbering systems, especially in very large family trees. And especially when we're talking about Sephardi family trees, they become very massive and you'll get a lot of the same names over and over. So in this family tree, there's about a dozen Abraham Nunes vases, a dozen Jacob Nunes vases, and the names continue on. So this is a great way to be able to keep track of who is who, um, especially when you're dealing with these digital trees and trying to put the newfound documentation in. So the, the way that we're gonna start is we're gonna start here with my great grandfather, Morris Nunes Vaz. He immigrated from London over to Boston where uh, my family now lives. And I wanted to basically find find out information on the family in London starting out. So in looking for the ancestry, one of the things I wanted to find was his birth record. And to do that, I found the general registry office record, uh, what's known as a GRO record. Anyone who's done any sort of genealogical research in the United Kingdom has very likely used these type of records. Um, and this is the birth of my great grandfather, Morris. Um, I'm just gonna pull up the highlighter here. Let's 
Sorry, I'm still getting used to the Zoom stuff. Oh, all right. Here we go. Okay. So here is my great grandfather Morris's name. We get his birth date, the 21st of May, 1897. We get his uh, location, his address. And then we also get his father's name, Abraham Nunes Vaz, and his mother, Jane Nunes Vaz, formerly Moscow. Um, he was a shoe laster. And then his uh, mother's name, Jane Nunes Vaz, living at 53 Princess Block. And then we get the date of the registration, the 28th of June. Um, the registration is not always going to be the same date as the actual date of the event. Um, but uh, so, so when you go to look for the records in the GRO, that is how they are separated is you'll do a little search and it'll be by the registration quarters. Um, so from here, we're, we're in the year 1897. And so I wanted to take it back just a little bit more. So I then looked for the marriage of Morris's parents, my second great grandparents, and that is here. Uh, this is also a GRO record and you get all of the typical information that you would want to find with a marriage record. You get the name of the groom and the bride, you get their ages, uh, you get their condition, bachelor, spinster, uh, profession, where they're living. And you also get the name of their father and their occupation. So both of their fathers are cigar makers, which was very common for a lot of the Dutch Jews who had come over to England. A lot of them came over uh, and they were cigar makers, laster, uh, boot lasters, hat makers, cobblers, things of that nature. Um, and what we also get is we get the witnesses in the presence of. So here we have Isaac Nunes Vaz, who I know to be my second great grandfather, Abraham's brother. And we get Herman Frankel, who I know to be my second great grandfather's brother-in-law. Um, but if I didn't know that, these are names that when you pull up the marriage, you want to look into these names if you don't know those, those names, because they're either going to be family members or close, close friends of things of that nature. So from here, we're in 1891, and I want to go further back in, in, in time. And the question is, when did they arrive in London from Amsterdam? I know the family came from Amsterdam. Well, if we're in 1891, I want to take a look at the census records. And in the UK, the census records are on the first year of the decade, or I guess technically second year. So 1891, 1881, 1871. Well, we're here 1891. Can I find them in 1881? And I was able to. And here we have that census record of 1881. Now it looks a little wonky and that's because they were at the end of one page and then went on to the second page. So I just kind of cut it together to look a little bit easier, but we get my third great grandfather, Raphael. And now you see the name is not spelled Nunes Vaz. It's almost Nunes Ways. And this is a good indicate. This is a good thing to point out with census records is that the name isn't always going to be what you expect, and a lot of times it will be a phonetic variation of what, of what it actually is. So my guess is is because of their, <clears throat> excuse me, because of their accent, that is why why the spelling's that way. But we get basic information. He's a cigar maker. He's from Holland. His wife is Rainer. Now, a lot of people have heard the name Reina. An interesting thing about my side of the family, and I don't know if this is common for any other people, I've never really heard this a lot, but the Reinas in my family are often referred to as Rainer. Uh, this is, this, the, uh, for, for my third great grandmother was the case. It was also the case for my great grandfather's sister, Rainer. Um, and then there's a, I, I think a first cousin once removed of my, or a second cousin once removed, something like that, where her name is also Rainer. But we get the name of the other, the children, Isaac, who's the oldest, who was born in London in Middlesex. Uh, we get Abraham, who is my uh, second great grandfather, Sarah, Rachel, Simi, uh, which would be Sima, many would know the name as, and Joseph and Hannah. But now we're in 1881, the family, we know Isaac, Abraham, and Sarah were born before 1871 in London. So can we find them in the 1871 census? And this one was a little harder to find 
because you may be able to see that here they spell the name Nunes Fas, N-U-N-A-S-F-A-S. So once again, we're getting that variation, the phonetic variation. Uh, all mm -hmm. the same, all the same information, cigar maker, location, where they're born. And now Isaac, we see, he was six years old in 1871. And the question was, when did they arrive in London? Well, if he was born in 18, or if he was six in 1871 and born in London, then we know that the family had to have been in London at least by 1865. So then the next thing to do was to try to find what's the latest records I could find in Amsterdam. Now, when I first started doing my research into the family in Amsterdam, uh, this was back in 2009, I contacted the Nord Holland Archief and I sent them information about my third great grandparents, Raphael and Reina. And I said, can you please send me anything that has to do with their marriage or their births? And what they sent me was basically an inventory that comes with uh, marriage records. So here we have three of those records. There's about 11 of them in total that I received. Um, but we get on here, the left, we have the name of the groom, Rafael Nunes Vaz, uh, gives information about his parents. Then we also have Reina, and then we have the name of her parents. So now we're back another generation. So now we've gone to my fourth great grandparents. So right here, Abraham Lopez Diaz, or sorry, Abraham Nunes Vaz and Sarah Lopez Diaz, who is his wife. And then over here on the right, we get information confirming the, the birth of them to their parents. I believe Tone had mentioned to me yesterday when we reviewed that the, this would have been something that they basically used to, um, to, to prove the birth or it, it was an index of the, the birth record. It, um, mm. So, so we get, we get, yeah. So we get this information here, but then um, in later years, I found a great record set that I wanted to see if I could find the Nunes Vaz family in as well in Amsterdam. Um, actually, sorry, before I jump ahead of myself, uh, where we were with trying to figure out when the family came from Amsterdam to London, the, la the last record we know of the family in London is 1865. Well, this marriage, which is in Amsterdam, is 1861. So we know that between 1861 and 1865 is when the family, at least my line, when my third great-grandfather, my third great-grandparents moved to London. So in taking further research, you know, that's, that's going to be the block of time where I'm going to look into. I haven't found a finite year yet, but in looking for more information about the family in Amsterdam, I wanted to look into the Bevalking registers. And here we have that. I'm going to clean out this pen marking one second. There we go. Uh, the Bavalking registers are basically like a census in, uh, in the Netherlands. You could, I, I like to think of them more like a revision list for anyone who's familiar with those from uh, the Russian uh, empire. It's it basically, it's like a census, but throughout the years, they will edit it. So you may notice that all of these names are crossed out. Well, that means that during this period of time where they were, working on the Vulcan registers, all of these people left this household. So it gives you information, not just on one solid date and time, but it gives you information over a period of time. So here we have my fourth great grandfather, Abraham Nunes Vaz. And then we have a bunch of his children, Reina, Leia, Isaac, Raphael, who's my third great grandfather, Aaron, Esther, and then down here, we have Rachel Enriquez Coelho, who was actually Abraham's second wife. Uh, now, something I want to mention real quick as well is up here for Abraham, it says Vlies Horror. Or I'm, I, I should give an aside. I'm an American and I may butcher a lot of words that I try to pronounce. I have to apologize ahead of time. Um, <laughs> but this, this, it basically it means that he's a butcher. Um, and something funny that uh, David pointed out when we were reviewing this is that Coelho means rabbit. So a butcher marrying someone with the last name rabbit, maybe there were a couple of jokes at, at the wedding. So taking, taking David's joke from yesterday. <laughs> but we get, we get a whole lot of information. And over here on the right side of the page, we get notes about what happens to the family. 
Um, different notes sometimes are harder to decipher. It may just be letters and numbers that you can't really tell what it means. Sometimes there will be dates. It'll have death dates. Uh, sometimes it'll even say where they moved. Um, for another uh, part of my family, uh, Dutch Ashkenazi branch of my family, it actually lists that they moved to London. So with the Bavalking registers, they are not, they're not only great in giving you that view of the family in Amsterdam or in the, in the Netherlands, but it, they're also really wonderful in terms of giving you information about what happens to the family. A uh, little aside I do want to say about the Bavalking registers is the registers are not complete. And the reason for this is that actually during World War II, the Dutch resistance blew up this registry. And the reason for that was because the Nazis were using that during the occupation to keep complete control over the population. They could use these to know everything about everyone. So by the resistance destroying a good portion of these records, they were actually able to save countless lives. Um, the 13 perpetrators who, who did the bombing were found out very quickly and executed. Um, and there's actually, I know there's a plaque in Amsterdam commemorating that. And I believe that there's a holiday. Uh, or there, if, there's... if I may jump in here, there's one, at least one member of that group who survived. And her name was Frida Belenfante. She is a member of the Cohen Belenfante family. And after the war, she went to America, to the United States, where she became one of the first, no, the first female conductor of a classical orchestra in the world. Uh, I have a picture here. Maybe you can see a bit of that. And she is completely forgotten. So the title of this biography is uh, A Magnificent Forgotten Life. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Thank you. So now I'm going to erase that pen. So continuing on from here, tracing through Amsterdam, I wanted to find more about the family. And one of the best places that I found was the Beth Haim Records. Uh, the Beth Haim Cemetery, um, <clears throat> which may, some may know more as Beth Haim van Oderkirk. Uh, this is the Portuguese Jewish cemetery for the uh, Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam. And there are an amazing set of records for this. So in looking through those records, I found my fourth great grandfather, who we just saw before in the Bavalking Register, uh, Abraham. And this is a V that stands for van, so son of, so Abraham, son of Jacob, son of Raphael. And this gives us a ton of information. But one thing I want to mention is that this is not a primary source. A lot of people confuse it as one. This is a secondary source. This is this was created using the records that are available that you can actually find now online through the Amsterdam archives. And not not all of these records are correct. Even in the Nunes Vaz family, we found a few that were incorrect and in that we had to use civil uh, register records to figure out the true information. But these are an amazing source of information on the family and where you can pull up those further records. So we have his birth date, G.E.B. Geborgen, uh, date that he was born. We have both the Hebrew date and the Gregorian date. Then we have his wives. We have Sarah Lopez Diaz, my uh, fourth great grandmother. And then we have his second wife that we mentioned before, Rachel Enriquez Coelho. And we have the dates of marriage over here on the right. And they give it in Hebrew date, but they do give us the Gregorian year. And we can use these then to look up more records. And all of these here that I'm circling, this is, this is, all notations that refer to specific records that you can then pull up. So as an example, this one down here, B-E-S-N, I'm not going to try to pronounce the actual Dutch word, but it, it's a reference to the circumcision rev registers for the community. So then if we wanted to find the circumcision for my fourth great grandfather, Abraham, we'd pull up those records and we can know to look up these numbers and we should be able to find him. We also get all of the information about his children. We get their birth dates in the Hebrew and uh, date and the Gregorian date. 
their names. And over here, you'll also notice notes. So here it's mentioning a marriage. She married in the Hebrew year 5608. Sometimes it may even give you the name of who, who married. So um, Abraham's daughter, Benvenida, she married Mordecai Lopez Cardoza. So you can get a lot of great information and then use these to go back in time. So we already know Abraham's father is Jacob, my fifth great grandfather, and his father is Raphael. So we want to find a Jacob, Ra Jacob son of Raphael, Nunes Vaz, in these same records. And what do you know? There he is. And we have all of the information about him. We have all of a bunch of notations. We get the name of his, his wife, his birth date, his birth year, the children, all of the names of them. And so then, you know, can we take it further? Yes. Oh, there. If the PowerPoint will work, yes, we can. So here we have Jake, uh, Jacob's father, Raphael. So now we're, we've gone fourth great grandfather, fifth great grandfather. Now we're at my sixth great grandfather, who was born in 1734 in Amsterdam. He married Sima Querido. And you may notice this V.J with a C. Uh, kind of uh, superimposed, that means Van Jacob, uh, son of Jacob. And in a lot of the different records that you'll find for the Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam, you'll find a lot of these notations to shorten names. So there's JC, uh, there, there's short uh, notation for Abraham, Isaac, um, a lot of them. So uh, some of these, if you start going through them, you will need to become familiar. And a lot of them, I think, are pretty straightforward to figure out. Um, but in going from here, taking it further, now that we're up to Chaim Raphael, who's my sixth great grandfather, we have his father's name, Jacob Nunes Vaz. Can we find him? Unfortunately, I could not find him in the records, in, at least in the Beth Chaim records, this record set. And there's a few reasons that that could be. One is that he may just not have died in Amsterdam. He may have died elsewhere um, as well. There's the possibility that there was a card that, or there wasn't a card that was created for him. Um, and a lot of the work that Tone Thielen has done, he has found in the Livro Longo books that there are records of burials at Beth Haim, but there's no correlating card in this Beth, Beth Haim record set to those burials. Um, so, there's those possibilities that, you know, he may have been buried there and there's just not the record or maybe he wasn't, but we will, we will look further into that in just a little bit. But I wanted to take this further. And one of the best places to look um, is actually, if we look right here on this card, you'll see O-N-D-E-R-T-R. -E this stands for Andetra Register, or this, these are the marriage bonds, bonds of marriage. Basically, it's when someone's going to get married, it's an announcement put up um, so that if anyone has a problem with the marriage, there's anything, someone can say something. And so I wanted to look into this record set because this record set gives a lot of great information, really good information. And I was able to find some, uh, some of those documents. So over here on the left, this is my sixth great grandfather, Rafael Nunes Vaz. Now you'll notice the name is spelled very oddly from what we're from how I spell it at least N U N E S V A S V A Z is how I spell it, but here Raphael is spelled Ravael, Nunes Vaz is almost Nunes Waz, and one of the reasons for this is because these were created by Dutch clerks. These are these are Dutch records, so you'll often find the Dutch variation of names in the Andetra registers, um, but. Beyond that, we also get here, it says Van A.M. That stands for Amsterdam. And then we also get information about the witness. So the witness for this was his mother, Sarah Valk, which uh, a lot of people may know the name as uh, Falcao. I, I can never pronounce this surname correctly. I always say it Falcao, but I know that's incorrect if David or Tom wanted to correct me. Um, but uh, then we also get his wife's name. And now this is uh, in Dutch, it's Semetje. Um, I'm not sure quite what they're going for. I'm assuming Keride, uh, but her name is Sima Querido. And so you get to see a very big variation on that um, from what you'd expect, at least from the Portuguese Jewish records. Because when you look at the records in the Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam, 
they will not be, they very likely will not be spelled in these ways. Um, but again, we get Van Amsterdam and then going through, we get that her mother was the witness, her mother, Diana. Um, but jumping to the next one, now that, now that we have my, uh, let's see, fourth, sixth great grandfather, we have my seventh great grandfather, Jacob, who we could not find in the record for Beth Hyam. So Jacob Nunes Vaz from Livorno. So now we've traced the family before Amsterdam. We know that the family before Amsterdam was coming from Livorno. Um, we also get now right here, um, I can't pronounce this, Tone pointed this out to me yesterday, um, but this, this means that uh, his parents had passed away at this point. Correct, Tone? Yes, um, I just don't. Yeah, so <clears throat> my death is not, not the, the best, but I can get by. Um, so we know that his parents are dead. And in the Ketuba, it actually does confirm, it says that his father is dead. It, it, I don't believe it mentioned his mother. Um, but we also get that his witness is his niece or could be cousin, Sarah Ribeiro. Now remember this name, her, his niece or cousin, Sarah Ribeiro as his witness. This will be important. And then we have, he's marrying Judith Volk, which before we saw that she was actually referred to as Sarah. Um, and uh, I believe she, she had her Judith Sarah Volk, uh, but she's from Amsterdam and her witness is her father, Abraham. And then down here we have the signatures uh, for Jacob and then the mark for uh, Judith. And then over here we have the signature for Raphael and Raphael's signature, I've seen his signatures on a couple of different documents and that R really stands out. And I'll be showing you a document in a little bit where we will see that, uh, that, that R that stands out a little bit. So from the on trial registers, I was able to also find the Ketuba. Um, I will give a shout out to Michael Waz. I, I'm not sure if he's in here. He's, he may he end is. up. Oh, mm -hmm. he is. Cool. Uh, thank you, Michael Waz. He was the one who found the Ketuba for me. And this is the Ketuba for the marriage of Jacob Nunes Vaz. And this, I mean, the Ketuba is just an amazing thing to see. You get this amazing signatures, but it also gives you information about the marriage and about just their lives. And this is where we knew for sure that Jacob's father, Abraham, had passed away by this point, which this marriage was in 1723. So jumping from here, I wanted to find more about the family in their year, early years in Amsterdam. Now the marriage was in December of 1723 and just four months later, March 21st, 1724, here we have a record from what's known as the Eskimoth books. These were the decisions by the Muhammad of the uh, Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam. And this is a record of Sadaka. And we get Judica married to David Nunes Vaz, and she's starting to receive Sadaka March 21st, 1724. So this gives us a great indication that we know that the family at this point was poor. Because if they're receiving Sadaka, they're poor, and this is the support of the community. So this is this is where we're getting into the earliest records of the family, and finding things are a bit scarce. Now, looking through the Amsterdam archives, there is a lot of digitized records that still need to be uh, still need to be gone through. So there could be something else hiding. But since we knew that the family came from Livorno, we knew Jacob came from Livorno could we find a record of him in Livorno? And I was lucky enough to find out that Barbara Martinelli had done research to trace the family back for, or sorry, not trace of it. She'd done research to digitize records in Livorno, which are available online. And in going through those records, which the link I have over here to the left uh, for the record set, but she had the Morty records, the Siri Morty, the death records. And here we can see Jacob Abraham Nunes Vaz from Amsterdam. And this is a record. This is March 27th, 1742. So everything's matching up here. Jacob, son of Abraham, assumed. It could be that it's a Jacob Abram, a different name, but everything seems to match up. So it's very likely that this is our Abraham, or our Jacob, uh, son of Abraham Nunes Vaz especially because there were no other Jacob Nunes vases I could find in Amsterdam, not to say that there weren't any there at that point, but I couldn't find anybody. 
So this was really giving us a great snapshot into Livorno. Now, as I did more research, I was able to find family members that I could not connect into the larger family tree. A lot of my work was trying to connect all of these Nunes Vaz family members I could find. And this is an Andatra register for Aaron Nunes Vaz from Cadiz. And this is great because this is the first documentation I found that gives an origin of the Nunes Vaz family in Iberia. Now, was he born there? Did he just live there? Did he travel through there? We don't quite know, but we know that there's at least a connection there. But now if you remember, I had mentioned, let's remember that name, the niece or cousin, Sarah Ribeiro. Well, let's take a look at who he's marrying. He's marrying Leah Ribeiro, and she's also from Cadiz. And her witness is her father, Miguel Ribeiro. And over here on the left, we can see, and even for someone who speaks English, you may notice Vaders, that's father, and consent, they received a letter of the father's consent. Um, Michael Waz, being the amazing researcher he is, he did more work and found the letter that they referred to. And in this letter, Miguel Ribeiro refers to Aaron Nunes Vaz as his nephew. So there's this very interesting connection where we have this marriage, 1727, just four years after the marriage of Jacob Nunes Vaz, where Jacob's um, niece or cousin, uh, Sarah Ribeiro, is the witness. And then we have an Aaron Nunes Vaz four years later marrying Alea Ribeiro and her father saying that Aaron is a nephew um, to him. So... My my hypothesis is that 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 one of um, that that Miguel Ribeiro likely married a Nunes Vaz, and this Aaron Nunes Vaz would be a nephew of his. There's a lot more work to do to figure that out. That's just a hypothesis, so it's not a proven thing. But this is an amazing document because this is giving us a really good view and a lot of great hints about the family. Um, as well as the letter, we were also able to find the ketubah for this marriage as well. Um, and uh, I was going to put it in here, but I ended up not being able to uh, find it again. So, I, uh, Michael, if you actually have that and can send it to me again, that'd be great. I'm not sure where I left it. Um, so um, continuing on from here, now that I had traced out the family pretty much as far back as I could go confidently, now I wanted to trace the family forward. And I was using a lot of the same record sets to trace forward. Um, and, you know, as I trace it back, you can use these to trace forward, especially the Beth Hyam records, giving all the children's names. You can then find their children in the Beth Hyam records. And then it, it just continues on from there. But the main goal I had was to find my living relatives, which I'm sure a lot of my relatives in this, uh, in this webinar right now remember my message to them of, hey, I think you're my cousin. So... Um, I started out uh, uh, using the Genie Collaborative tree as a main point for this. Um, I started this in 2009 and I really enjoyed using Genie for this because Genie does what's known as a collaborative tree where instead of having a thousand singular trees each run by one person, it has one singular tree where when people get their way into their tree, they then merge their tree into others. Um, I'm not going to discuss the pros and cons of it, other than the fact that for doing what I was doing and trying to find all of the family, it had a big pro in being able to not only build out their part of the family tree, but then connect them within to the genie tree, and then they were able to add and edit their own branches. So it really made the tree stronger because for a lot of these modern branches, they're being built by the actual people of it instead of me kind of sneakily trying to figure out what's going on with their family. So it's really made it great. Um, another amazing tool has been social media. When I first started actually trying to find my relatives. I've been obsessed with genealogy since I was a kid. I just never actually took the time to do it properly. So my first time doing it was back when I was in high school and I was on MySpace finding anybody with the Nunes Vaz name and sending them a message saying, my mom is a Nunes Vaz, are you my cousin? 
But in, in further years, I began to refine what I did. And eventually when Facebook came, that really, really let things take off um, just because Facebook is a world directory of sorts. Um, so I, I've been able to find a lot of relatives on there. But another place that a lot of people don't really realize is a great source to find people, especially those who aren't on Facebook, is Twitter. Um, there are a lot of people who are on Twitter, um, even if they're not necessarily active on Twitter, a lot of people have accounts on Twitter just to keep up with what's going on with Twitter. Um, but with the social media, I also created a Facebook group for the family, which has, I believe, about 250 members in there right now, um, which is just a small portion of the entire family tree. In total, I was able to connect four, over 4,000 descendants of the Dutch family tree. So that's over 4,000 people descending specifically from Jacob Nunes Vaz, who was the son of Abraham Nunes Vaz. And in that, I was able to connect over 1,400 living descendants. And so you can see the 250 number, that's only a portion of the total number that we are actually in touch with. Um, but the family is just absolutely massive. And this has been my main piece of work in my genealogy is really building this out. Um, in doing that, I was able to find the name changed over time, which is not uncommon. Uh, most of the time it was Nunes Vaz, N-U-N-E-S-V-A-Z. Uh, some of the cousins who uh, immigrated to Australia or the US, New Zealand, South Africa, England, they would put a dash in between, especially just countries where the double surname isn't the normal, the normal thing. Um, then some of the family changed it to V-A-S. There was also a branch where they changed it to N-U-N-I-S for Nunes Vaz. And the reason for that is a lot of people will think that Nunes is pronounced Nunez, which is the Spanish way. But we pronounce it the Portuguese way, Nunes. It's a very big thing. All of the all of the distant branches that I've connected to with the name were all very specific about that. And so some of the branches changed it to N-U-N-I-S. Um, a lot of the American branches, especially the branch that I descend from, they just shortened it to Nunes. They dropped the Vaz. And then there was a whole nother branch that changed it to N-U-N-A-S, Nunes. So there was a big variation, but this was really important because while we have the Dutch branch of the family, there are other branches of the family, which we will discuss in a bit. And the different branches all have their variations on the surname change in sort of specific ways. So we'll get into that in a little bit further. But clearing this out, here I want to show this is a really amazing uh, document, or not document, this is a really amazing graph. This is a graph of the entire Nunes Vaz family tree, the over 4,000 uh, descendant built family tree. And each dot that you see is the representation of somebody being born. So this blue dot is the patriarch of the family, um, Abraham Nunes Vaz. Then we have uh, Jacob Nunes Vaz, and these pink dots are... Um, something I, I won't discuss, another branch of the family I was kind of looking into. Um, but each dot is a representation of somebody. And the pink dots are the representation of a birth of a daughter and the blue dots are the representation of a birth of a son. So each dot is a representation of somebody. Now I do want to point out, you may notice this big black line right here. And that black line is the representation of the year 1945. Um, I got this idea from the researcher, uh, Laura Diamond. Um, where she was visualizing her family trees using these same graphs um, in the Holocaust, what happened in the Holocaust. And so I did the same thing. And what you may notice is that before that black line, it is just a very, very dense graph. And then after that black line, it's very, very sparse. And that's just a, a, a represent, that's the representation of the absolute decimation that the Shoah had on the Nunes Vaz family. And you'll, you may notice this branch right here, which still is, it's still fairly dense even after that line. And the reason for that is this is, this is the branch of the family I come from, which immigrated out of Amsterdam in the 1800s. So they left well before the Holocaust and were thus not affected by it. So it really gives you an idea of what, what the family could have been. Um, so 
So continuing from here, now that we've traced out all of these family members, I've contacted hundreds of them. Can we, can we prove the paper trail using DNA? And what I'm going to show today is the ancestry through lines. Um, and now we have, we have family members who have tested on every single main company um, of DNA, but for ancestry through lines, it's just an amazing tool to visualize those connections. So I didn't test on ancestry. My mom is the one who actually tested. And this is her right here, SR, the uh, purple. So then we have my grandfather, my great grandfather, and then my great great grandfather. And here we have a bunch of matches who also descend from my second great grandfather. Um, now I'm not gonna go really into detail about the difference of uh, centimorgans, but just to know centimorgans down here, that CM, that is just a measurement of DNA. And we use that measurement of DNA to estimate about how far somebody is in distance to relation. But it's not a perfect science and this really helps go to show it. I'm gonna try to move that, there we go. So, so here we see that this second cousin has 236 centimorgans. Then we have another second cousin who has 285 centimorgans. A second cousin once removed with 159, and then a second cousin once removed with 64. So the second cousins are fairly close, but you can see that second cousin once removed, one of them is 159, and the other is almost a third of that at 64 centimorgans. So you can really find a big variation. And as you go further back in relation, you can see that. So here we're just at my great grand or my second great grandfather, my mom's great grandfather. So now let's look at the descendants of the next generation. Uh, clear these out. So now we're up to my third great grandfather, Rafael Nunes Vaz. So here we have my mom and our branch of the tree tracing to Abraham. And over here on the left, we have my uh, third great uncle, Isaac Nunes Vaz's line. And one of his descendants who tested, a third cousin once removed to my mom, is 46 centimorgans. Then we look over here to the right, and you can see that there are five DNA matches on here. I couldn't fit them all on here, so I just wanted to use uh, one to just show that. So this cousin, she was matching at 66 centimorgans as a third cousin. So we can see that it's getting a little bit lower as we go back. But even though she's a third cousin, she's matching at almost about the same amount as that second cousin once removed we looked at before. So erasing those markings. Now we're going to go back another generation. So now here's my, my branch of the family. And we have, there's, there's another, over to the right, there is another sibling who has descendants who have DNA matches, but obviously I couldn't fit it all in here. Um, but tracing down, we can see these variations. We have a cousin, a fourth cousin at 61 centimorgans and another fourth cousin at six centimorgans. Then we have a fourth cousin once removed at 12 centimorgans. Now, one thing I, I have to say at this point is once you're getting down to these really low amounts of centimorgans, the confidence level of, of where you're getting those, those shared DNA from is very low. So even though we share six centimorgans, or my mom shares six centimorgans, and we know that there is a relation, the paper trail shows us that, we cannot say for sure that those six centimorgans are coming from that line. It's possible that they're related through another way, especially when you're dealing with Jewish endogamy. We all know the, the, the fact of all of the, for hundreds of years, Jews married Jews. And so you know, thousands of years, really. So with, with all of that, you're dealing with a lot of problems where um, basically certain people that will seem like they're a relative to you may not be a relative or a way you can put it that's easy is a false positive. So in this case, it could be a false positive for us, even though we know we're related and we have shared DNA, that DNA may not be from the Nunes Vaz line. She may, maybe she's got Lopez Diaz uh, DNA through another uh, ancestry of hers. And that's where we're sharing it. Um, and for anyone who's, who's part of the Western Sephardic diaspora, who has one of these massively built trees, you will often find that if you find someone who you're related to, it's not uncommon to also find one, two, or even more other families that you also share in common. Um, 
Now I was also able to take it back another generation. So now we're really far back to my fifth great grandfather and I could barely fit anything in here. But um, for, for this line here, uh, Benvenida, she married a Melhado and one of her descendants, a fourth cousin once removed is matching at 24 centimorgans. And then over here, we have a fifth cousin matching at 10 centimorgans. So once again, we're dealing with those issues of are they, are they actually from Nunes Vaz or not? So it doesn't necessarily confirm that, you know, Jacob, the paper trail is correct for us, but it, it, it gives us a good, a good hint. Um, but once you're getting this far back, it really gets difficult to show that. And where we really wanted to take it was tracing, tracing the family into these other uh, further branches uh, that were not part of Amsterdam. Um, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Next, I want to talk about DNA painters. So what we, were, what we were doing before is we were showing, okay, we have these cousins. We know that the paper trail says we have these shared ancestors. Well, if that's the case, we can make the guess that the shared DNA that we have is going to be from those common ancestors, our most recent common ancestors. So you can use DNA painter to paint that or it's called chromosome mapping. And you can use that to then figure out where you're getting certain blocks of DNA from in your ancestry. And then when you find a DNA match where you don't know how they're related, when you overlay that with your DNA or your DNA paint or your chromosome map, you can get an idea of where in your family tree they might be. Here we have mine, uh, my, my DNA painter profile. And you'll notice that for each chromosome, there's two bars, one bar on top and one bar on bottom. And that, that's because you get 23 pairs of chromosomes, one part of that pair coming from your mom and one part of that pair coming from your dad. So when you do DNA painting, if you know a, a match is from your mom, you then assign it to your maternal chromosome and then it will, it'll paint it to that, the, those maternal chromosomes. So what's great with DNA painters, you can then single out your maternal side for DNA painting. So here that's that representation. And I've enlarged the, um, the key down here just so it's easier to see. And right off the bat, I just want to point out, you'll see in blue, that's my grandma, Betty. Um, and I was lucky enough to have my grandmother test. And when you have a grandparent test for DNA painting, it is amazing because if you're looking at your maternal chromosomes and you already have your grandmother, who's one half of those maternal chromosomes, you know that wherever your grandmother is not matching, that must be coming from your grandfather. So same, you know, if you had your grandfather test, then you can do the same thing with your grandmother. So this is a great way because now we know anything not from my grandma Betty is going to be from my, my grandfather, Myra Nunes Vaz. So in painting these matches, we can really get a good idea of the family. And now we're gonna take a look at some specific chromosomes further. So here, this is my 20th chromosome opened up. Now, each bar that you see, that is the representation of a singular match. And the color of that bar referenced in the key are our most common recent shared ancestors. So for these two pink bars, they are our most recent common ancestors are my grandparents. So these two pink bars, they're either one, they're either my uncle or one of my cousins who have tested. But then for this green bar, this is coming from my second great grandparents, Abraham Nunes Vaz and Jane Moscow. So we know that this part, this part, this cousin who's, that's our most recent common ancestor, that's coming from that side. Then we can take it back a little bit further. We have this brown uh, segment and that's coming from my fourth great grandparents, Rafa, or my third great grandparents, Rafael Nunes Vaz and Raina Robles. So we can see how that as, as we're getting further back in time, those segments become smaller. So because we know that Rafael and Raina Robles are the father of Abraham Nunes Vaz and uh, who married Jane Moscow, we can basically estimate that this portion of that green bar is coming from Abraham Nunes Vaz. And we don't know where the other part of the bar is coming from. It could also be from Abraham Nunes Vaz. And it's just that this cousin here didn't receive that. But we can know for sure that right here, if I get a match and they are matching, they are matching cousins from Nunes Vaz, but they don't know anything about their family. And then they have a segment that's matching right here. That's giving me an indication. These could be Nunes Vaz cousins. And the, we, we're going to want to look through Rafael Nunes Vaz 
or possibly Reina Robles. It could be from the Robles side. But this is not a perfect science. As we said, there is the case of endogamy. There's also issues with errors in reading the DNA. When they're reading DNA, they're reading thousands of markers of, what, of what's known as SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is just a fancy word for a mutation. And those mutations are how we tell. But with the endogamy and the problems of error, you can get it where it may not look right. So here we have my 19th chromosome. Now, as, we, as I mentioned, that blue bar, that's my grandmother, my grandma Betty. So anything that's from the blue bar, or anything not from the blue bar is where we should expect any of the Nunes vases to match. But if you notice, we have this green bar, a cousin of mine who our most recent common ancestor are my, they're my second, my second great grandparents, Abraham Nunes Vaz and Jane Moscow. But the overlap is overlapping my grandma Betty. So we, we, we have a very low confidence here of that this green bar is coming from the Nunes Vaz side. Um, it could be because of an error. It could be what's known as an artifact. It could also be, um, it could just be the fact that I'm related to this cousin through my grandma Betty in some way that I just don't even know. So this is just to show that you, you do have to look at these further than just taking it as fact. It's kind of like with the, the paper trail. When you get a document, you can't take it all as fact. You need to learn about the context of the document, find correlating documents. Is there anything that contradicts that? And that's what we have here. We're having a contradiction. Um, so this really just goes to show that it's not always perfect, but DNA still is an amazing tool to really take that, that research further. But a big part of the DNA is also doing a DNA to connect the other branches, which now I will talk about the other branches. So the first one I will talk about are the Italian Nunes Vaz family branches. And these are the oldest branches of the family. They trace back to 17th century Livorno, which for the Amsterdam family, Jacob Nunes Vaz was born about 1697 in Livorno. We know his father, Abraham, was likely in Livorno, and he probably would have been born about the 1670s. But for the Italian family trees, we have the branches with confirmed birth dates for, for many family members in the 17th century, as well as other, other documents that relate to them. Most of my work in building out these Italian family trees started out by using just what was online, trying to find many of the Nunes Vaz descendants of these families. And many of them connecting would send me all sorts of notes, their own research, um, which if, if anyone's ever been a little shy about trying to contact relatives, I highly suggest doing it because not only is it great to connect with your relatives, but it's also an amazing tool in researching because they may have all sorts of information you do not have. But in, in building that out, I was quickly hitting a lot of brick walls. And to take that further, what I needed to do was I needed to hire somebody on the ground. And for that, I hired Matteo Gianti, who runs uh, leghornmerchants.wordpress. You can actually find some great indexes on there um, for anyone researching in Livorno. And you can also find, uh, find his Facebook page here. Uh, but in the work that he did, he was able to identify 10 branches, unconnected branches, uh, as far as we could figure out. And he used mostly the non-Catholic civil registers, which are indexed on his website, as well as the uh, birth record, the birth indexes. Um, but then using the work that Matteo did, as well as the work that I had already built out with the cousins, I was then able to identify two main branches that we wanted to focus on. We had Dr. Abram Nunes Vaz, who was married to Alea. And with that family, we had 55 connected descendants we could find. And we had only two connected living descendants. I've been in touch with one of them. I know he has other living relatives. I haven't been able to get information to trace that out. As well, there's another branch of, the of this part of the family which um, contacted me. I'm not quite sure how they're connected in. I'm hoping to hear back from them soon. Um, but it seems that they may have changed the name from Nunes Vaz to uh, something else during the Holocaust. Um, but the other family was that descending from David Nunes Vaz, who passed away in 1727. In that family, we have 82 connected descendants and 20 connected living descendants, uh, many of whom I am in touch with and uh, many of whom are actually in the Facebook group for the Nunes Vaz family. Um, 
now the families, this, this family is very well known. Um, for anybody who has ever researched in Livorno, it's very likely you've heard about some of the Nunes Vaz rabbis. There's Mario Nunes Vaz, who's a famous photographer, Italo Nunes Vaz, who was a famous um, uh, painter. Um, there, there were a lot of really well-known members of the family as well. There's also a Villa Nunes Vaz in Ferenz. And um, a lot of my family members, I believe David Nunes Vaz is in, in here today, who's in London. Um, I have a letter that was written to him by Gigi Del Monte, who may also be in here today, um, talking all about that Nunes Vaz, or the Nunes Vaz Villa and the ancestry with it. And it's just, it, the family there is just truly, truly amazing. Uh, but one, one really interesting thing that I do want to point out, though, is that the famous painter Talon Nunes Vaz actually descends from both Dr. Abram Nunes Vaz and David Nunes Vaz. And just to show off Italo a bit, here is one of his paintings. Um, I believe this painting is called The Queen um, Before Supper, something like that. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but one thing that I always like to think is that maybe this is a scene of Nunes Vaz family and, you know, get a glimpse of the, the what the family might look like from the Italian Nunes Vaz side. Um, but just to show also, since we talked about these non-Catholic civil registers, I wanted to show what one of those looks like. So here we have one of those non-Catholic civil registers that Matteo sent me. I'm going to clear that pen off. And so we get all of this great information. We have an Abramo Nunes Vaz. Um, I can move this. I can see what it fully says. <laughs> Our Zoom's not working with me. There we go. Brahmo Nunes Vaz, born in 1838. We get the information about his parents, where he's born, uh, just different information. This is what uh, a lot of what uh, Matteo used to build out that part of the tree. Um, and you can find these indexed on his website. Um, just going back in case no one got that, leghornmerchants.wordpress.com slash ACRL. So I'll give you a second to get that. Um, all right. So continuing on from there, now that we had the Italian families, now I wanted to look into the Jamaican families. So in the Jamaican families, uh, most of my research was done through Jamaican Family Search, which is not part of FamilySearch.org, the Mormon Church website. Um, this is run by a singular person who just has an interest in genealogy. And the records that he has on here are not just Jewish records. So if you're researching in Jamaica for any sort of ancestry, you may find this useful. But it has an amazing amount of not just Sephardi records, but also Ashkenazi records for the communities that were in, in Jamaica. And the link for that is here. And as well, I also used Haruth Communications, which is uh, they have a portion called Jewish Jamaica. And the, um, this is also a website that is run by a singular person. And um, there's some great uh, stuff on here, especially including a couple of digitized books that are very hard to find. Um, the link to that is right here. All right. But through this work, building out the trees, as well as finding a couple of trees online, connecting with different descendants as well, there were two main branches I identified. The first is for Jacob Nunes Vaz, who died in 1810 in Jamaica. And he had 146 connected descendants. And of those 146 connected descendants, we have 92 known living connected descendants. Um, I've been in touch with a lot of these cousins. A lot of them are also starting to, they come out of the woodwork every once in a while. Um, so this is a, this has been a great, great source in this side as well. We have Phineas Nunes Vaz, who was born 1800, died 1844. Um, he, he lived in Jamaica. He died in Philadelphia though. Um, one unfortunate thing I do want to mention though, is that uh, there were records that tied him to slavery, unfortunately. Um, so uh, an unfortunate part of that, that history for us, but um, Phineas was in Jamaica. He worked as a merchant. Um, we actually do have his will that was placed in Philadelphia. And for him, we have 76 connected descendants. And of those 76, there are 54 living connected descendants. Um, now, 
in the Jamaican families, I discussed for the Dutch family, the change of surnames. And for the Italian family, the surname was almost always spelled N-U-N-E-S-V-A-I-S. -E but for the Jamaican families, they went with more of a Portuguese Spanish custom for their surname. So basically they would drop the noons, keep just the Vaz and then add the mother's maiden name to their surname. So examples are Vaz Capriles, Vaz de Jong, Vaz Arce. Um, so this was the commonality that I would find with these Jamaican families. In more modern times, I found that a lot of this, these members of the family just dropped everything else and just kept it as Vaz. Um, so there are a lot of members who have connected with me ha that have just that last name of Vaz, V-A-Z. Now, the Jamaican families weren't the only Nunes Vazes in, um, in the Americas. We also had a family in Suriname. And in the Suriname family, I use a lot of amazing records that are digitized online. The first one is from the National Archief, and this is for the Portuguese Jewish community. And the record set here that is going that ranges from 1678 to 1909. And you can get that link here. Um, you will need to know Dutch to go through these records. I believe there are there's Hebrew uh, throughout and also Portuguese. Um, but along with these records, we go. I also was using the book Remnant Stones, the Jewish Cemeteries and Synagogues of Suriname by Aviva Benyor and Rachel Frankel, which um, just a little aside, uh, Aviva will be doing a talk next week, um, which uh, they'll talk about a little bit at the end of this. Um, but this book is an amazing source. It gives indexes of the burials. Um, it gives a lot of different information and it was very helpful in being able to trace out the family. Um, from doing that, I was able to, to find that there was one main patriarch. His name was Isaac Nunes Vaz, Ishak Nunes Vaz, or some, I believe, Itzhak Nunes Vaz. He was born around 1755, and uh, he died in 1785, his burial being listed in the, the book uh, Remnant Stones. And through him, we have found 156 connected descendants. And of those, there are 88 connected living descendants. Um, so we were able to get a lot of stuff for this family as well. So we've connected with members of, the, of this part of the family and are still tracing out further. Now for the surname for this family, it, they basically just dropped the noon, switched to Vaz, but instead of V-A-Z, which many of the Jamaican family use, they shortened to V-A-S. So it just, just an interesting little note of how each branch of the family changed their, their surname just ever so slightly. Now here we have a despacho record, and this is the only record that we have tying the Dutch family to the Suriname family. And this is the record for Aaron, son of Raphael Nunes Vaz. Now, before, if you remember, I mentioned that signature of my, my uh, fifth grade grandfather, Raphael Nunes Vaz, and how that R really stood out. And here, that's it's him later in life with that very kind of specific flourished R. Not quite as flourished as the last one, but just something interesting. It's something that is really good for anyone doing research. Note the signatures, because you may find documents where it doesn't correlate any information, but that signature you can correlate to something that does have correlating information. Now, we don't know what happened to this Aaron Nunes Vaz. We don't know if there's no record of him dying in Suriname. Um, I do have a hypothesis, though, because Phineas Nunes Vaz in Jamaica, he married a woman who was the daughter of an Aaron Nunes Vaz. So I've thought that it's possible that maybe he went from Suriname to Jamaica, or at least his daughter did, where she then married a Phineas Nunes Vaz. Um, but that's just all an assumption. I'm, you know, it's a hypothesis. So more research will be needed to confirm that. Um, but these despacho records are an amazing record sort or a record set. Um, they are a record set of the Jewish, the Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam giving money to their members, often poor uh, members of the community, to then travel elsewhere to become part of other communities, uh, Jewish communities, Sephardic Jewish communities around the world. Um, but this was giving us that, that, that glimpse that it's very likely that all of these other branches that we're seeing are the same families. But the question is, are they the same families? And to do that, we need to do Y DNA. 
Now, this project that we're doing for the Nunes Vaz family, it's being done through the Avatenu Western Safari YDNA project, which is being run by Adam Brown and Michael Waz. And um, in doing this, they've actually identified the Nunes Vaz family as a very important family for them to study, which, you know, hearing news as a researcher of, you know, a big research team, you know, they, they want to research your family. It's like, yes, awesome. So there's been a lot of great work gone into this. And, um, and but, but just explain what it is for those who don't know, the Y chromosome is something that is passed from father to son almost unchanged. So you can use that to look at your purely patrilineal line by getting it tested and comparing your Y DNA to others. So with that said, then our hypothesis would be that if each branch of the Nunes Vaz family the, are, are the same paternal family, they should match through Y-DNA. Now, I've wanted to get six main branches of that family to test. So we have the Italian branches, which we talked about. We have the Dutch branch, my branch. We have the two Jamaican branches. And then we have the Suriname branch. Now, we have tested members of the Dutch branch. There's two members who have done the Y-DNA for the Dutch branch. We've also tested the Jamaican branches, Jacob Nunes Vaz and Phineas Nunes Vaz, and they all match. So this is telling us that we know for sure that if we trace up their paternal lines, we will find a connection somewhere. Now, the question is, where is that connection? And we still need to figure that out. That's going to be the hard part. But this is still an amazing tool for us to tell, you know, are we looking in the right place or are we not? Now, unfortunately for the Suriname branch, I have not been able to find any eligible cousins to test. There are descendants, but uh, I think it's about two or three generations back, there was one last male Nunes Vaz member and all of his children were daughters. So if there are, Nuna, if there are patrilineal descended um, members of that family, they are still yet to be found. Based on the research I've done and all the documentation I have, I don't believe they're there. Um, and unfortunately, autosomal DNA is just going to be too distant. As we were looking at before with just the Dutch branch where we could tell, it gets back to the point where even if they are sharing DNA, we can't tell is that coming from the same family. So unfortunately for the Suriname family, it may, it, it, it may be only the paper trail to help us figure this out. Now for the Italian branches, we have not tested anyone as far as I know. There may be something that's happened uh, that I didn't know about, but I have contacted members of these of, of uh, David Nunes Vaz um, who have the Nunes Vaz name, who should be matching Y-DNA. Um, they've shown interest. I don't know if any of them have actually gone through with it yet. Um, hopefully they will, and then we can figure that out. But for Abram Nunes Vaz, we're still working to find a actually known Y-DNA descendant, um, a Nunes Vaz descendant. So there's still a lot of work going into this. But for anyone who has families like this, especially one of the Sephardi families where you find different members of the family in different Jewish communities, you may find them in Amsterdam, you may find them in London, you may find them in South Carolina, and you may find them in Jamaica or Suriname or in Livorno or Morocco or Tunisia or just any sort of Jewish community, and you can't connect them to your branches, you can use Y-DNA to do that. Um, so it's really an amazing tool. But from here, we still have a lot of places to go. Uh, for the Y DNA, we do want to test those Italian cousins. And I personally would like to test more of the Dutch cousins just because we have those cousins reaching far back to the point where the autosomal DNA is kind of not useful. So then getting the Dutch cousins to test, even though, you know, I'm pretty sure they are, it would be just kind of nice to get that. Um, as well, I'd like to do upgraded test kits from what we've done. Most of the tests that we've done are what's known as Y37. It means that they've tested 37 markers. Um, there's a Y37, a Y67, a Y11, and then there's, a, or not Y11, Y111. And then there is a big Y. I would love to get the big Y done, which is the most, um, I don't want to say precise. It's not the right term, but I'll just say that here. Um, that, that gives you the best reading. And so by getting all of them to upgrade, I would like to eventually get to the point where we can almost assign specific DNA markers to specific ancestors within the Nunes Vaz family. 
Um, as well, the next step for the Livorno family, I am very eagerly awaiting the uh, Katuba book about the uh, Livorno uh, community. Um, uh, there was a talk about that. I can't remember if it was last week or two weeks ago. Um, Elaine Najar did it, who was one of the writers. I'm guessing he's probably in here today. I can't tell. Um, but uh, you can order this book online. I'm still waiting for it. But my hope is, is that this will allow me to connect a lot of those separate branches that we couldn't connect otherwise and possibly find more relatives that we didn't know about. Uh, for the Amster for the Dutch branch of the family, there's still a lot of records to go through in the Amsterdam archive, specifically the uh, inventory 334, which are the, the inventory of records for the Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam. There are a couple of other uh, record sets. I know one that Tone uh, goes through a lot are the notary sets, um, which I've tried to. Those are yeah. very difficult to go through. There are a lot of them and a lot of different mm -hmm. notaries a lot of different things. Um, but there's a lot of things that could be hiding in these records that we just don't know about. So that's going to be a step. As well, the National Archive in, uh, that has the Suriname records, there's a lot of stuff digitized on there. And so going through that for 1678 to 1909 will give us a lot of information. And then the last thing I want to do, which has been my goal since the beginning, is to contact Nunes Vaz cousins, which if anyone in here is a Nunes Vaz cousin or believes they descend from a Nunes Vaz, um, get in touch with me. There's especially, I want you to join the Facebook group on, on, uh, uh, for the family. Um, but one thing I should mention, I, I meant to mention this earlier, is there's also a Vaz Nunes family, a Vaz Nunes family. And from all of the research that we've done for the paper trail, DNA, everything, it shows that those two families are very likely separate families. Nothing seems to indicate a connection between them. And so there's, but, but with that said, there's still a whole lot that I can do for the Nunes Vaz family and there's still a lot to be done. But with that, that is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much uh, for sticking around for the entire thing. I know I gab on a lot. I don't know if there were any questions um, to be had. Um, so uh, I'll leave it up to Tony and David now. Yes, thank, 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 thank you very much. I mean that was that was uh, that was absolutely incredible. Uh, it was also actually um, our, our best attended uh, talk so far. I think between at one point between uh, Zoom and uh, Facebook, we had 120 people uh, listening, which is oh, kind of impressive. So right. well <laughs> and, and that, um, and. Um, Tom, Tom will, Tom will um, relay some, some questions to you in a second. I, I, I'm actually also watching um, on my phone, I'm, I'm watching Facebook. So if anybody on Facebook has any, any questions, um, we can uh, relay that. Um, just, I, I, I saw in the, uh, the chat, Adam Brown uh, mentioning that if anybody is interested in the, uh, the Y DNA project to, to get in touch, um, and um, I'm sorry, I, I, I wasn't watching the, the, the group chat very much. Tom, do you want to, uh, to field the questions? Yes, um, one question you already answered about a possible connection between Nunez Vaz and Vaz Nunez. It seems not to exist, but um, there was another question which I found uh, uh, a bit interesting, which is uh, um, why don't we dig up uh, the graves at Bet Chaim and Amsterdam? Oh. So we find an ancestor from 1757, extract his DNA, and uh, in that way we will be all the wiser. I, I don't think it's going to happen, but connected to that is the question how do we know? the DNA of someone from 1757. Jarrett, you need to, you're, you're, uh, you've muted yourself. You're still muted. There we go. And you're still muted. There we go. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. I accidentally muted myself. It wouldn't let me unmute. So, I'm sorry, uh, the, the question was, uh, how can we tell the DNA of someone, an ancestor from 1765? Yes, like that? or about that year. 
Um, well, we really can't. Uh, I mean, there, there, there are things that people do for more recent ancestors. So let's say that you wanted to figure out what your great grandfather's DNA was, and you get you know ten different cousins who all descend from that great grandfather to test. You can then find all of their shared DNA and use that to make an assumed profile even though it, it'll be missing a lot. There's actually a tool on GEDmatch for anyone who does DNA and is on GEDmatch to do that. But when you're talking about an ancestor from 1765, then you're talking about getting to a distance where even if you are matching cousins, it may not be from that ancestor. It may be from another ancestor. If it's 1765, mm -hmm. you're usually, if for someone of my generation, you're usually looking at maybe a fourth, fifth, sixth great grandparent, um, you know, for some, you may be looking at like a second great grandparents. Um, so if that's the case, you might be able to do something like that. Um, but outside of that, really the only tool you have is if you can do Y DNA and that's not really going to tell you all of their DNA. That's just going to give you their Y DNA signature. Um, and even then they, they're at, if you were to get that, dig them up and get their DNA tested, their DNA may not be exactly the same just because, as time goes on, there are mutations in the DNA, which mm -hmm. is how we can figure out these relations between people. So as much as that would be a wonderful thing to be able to do, unfortunately, um, as far as I can tell, as far as I know, that it's not really something you'd be able yeah. to do. It's not possible. Another question was, uh, did your ancestors live in Spain under the Inquisition or Will you be able to, to trace back to Spain at some point? Well, that, that is the hope. That is the hope. At this point, the only connection that we have um, is the uh, Andatra register for Aaron Nunes Vaz that shows that he's from Cadiz. Now, I will say um, I do have this book uh, by Lionel Levy. And in this book, he does talk about the Nunes Vaz family. And there's mention of connection to Villarreal. Um, there was even mention of people with the name Nunes Vaz Villarreal. Um, I tried to look further into it. I, I couldn't really find anything substantial. Interestingly enough, this book actually says that the that um, that the Nunes Vaz family descends from the famous mathematician Pedro Nunes. Um, and I, I would love to see if that's true. <laughs> if anyone yes. has that information, send it on over to me. Um, but at this point, we, we don't, they, they could have been from Spain, they could have been from Portugal, they may, they may have done what a lot of typical families from that ended up in Amsterdam did where they had lived as conversos for a couple of generations. Um, it's also possible there were a lot of families that went to Livorno who had not done that. Um, both Livorno and Amsterdam were big hubs of the, not just the Western Sephardi world, but the mm -hmm. Sephardi world and the Jewish world in total. And so you have all sorts of movement throughout. So there's, there's a lot of possibility, but at this yeah. point, the only thing that we have showing any sort of traces is that one marriage record. And even then we can't actually connect to him into the overall family tree that we have. So it's even possible that he's not a Nunes Vaz like us. He may just have chosen Nunes Vaz by chance and he's a separate, you know, separate family member. Um, I don't think that's the case, but it's a possibility to keep in mind. Yeah. And then Nadja mentioned that there are 25 Nunez Vaz marriages in his book. So yeah. that's something to look forward to. <laughs> uh, a few families were mentioned which look a bit similar like yours, like Meliado and the Mesa. Uh, Meliado is, is Italian, I know. Is the Mesa also Italian? And do you know something about them? Uh, I did a little bit of research into the de Mesa family. Actually, part of the research I did was to help uh, Adam and uh, Michael for the Western Y Safari project to help find a descendant. And I was able to find one, a Tarquin de Mesa, who I don't know if he's in here, but I know he's part yes, of the- Yes, he is in here. Okay, well- He is the one who posed the question. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So- um, I don't remember exactly if that family, I'll have to look again. Um, and um, I'll, I'll send that to you, Tarquin, because I'm connected with you already. So, um, okay. but 
yeah, a great family though. Amazing, amazing family to research with a lot of amazing characters. Yes, um, I've, I've done some research in it also. And uh, according to me, there are two the Mesa families <laughs> yeah. so far. So yeah. it's a bit similar like Nunez Vaz in that you have different branches that are difficult to connect. Yeah, and, and Maybe especially the same. Yeah, mm -hmm. with the double surnames, especially like in Livorno, there's a lot of records marriages for just Nunes or just Vaz. And mm -hmm. there's a question where they knew Nes Vaz and they just went with Noons or where, you know. So yeah, definitely that 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 can make things difficult within Sephardi research. Yes. And and Val mentioned his project and he uh, is calling upon everyone who is interested to take part in this study into a YDNA uh, uh, research for male Sephardic Western. Uh, Western Sephardic uh, persons. So I heartily uh, recommend that. And uh, that's about it. Uh, Adam, Adam will also be, be talking to us. Um, in a uh, yes. Oh, yes. And you mentioned uh, the notary archives. We will have at a later date Harmon Snell, who will talk about the uh, the, the gigantic project that the Amsterdam archives are undertaking and digitizing all notary, notarial records and uh, indexing them at the same time. And it's estimated ev everyone who ever was in Amsterdam will be mentioned at least once in there when they are finished with it. So that's something to look forward to in the next uh, six or seven years. Yes. To see it completed. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of, there's a sort of comment and a, a, a question on, on Facebook. Uh, there's a comment that there was a, a, a Nunez Villarreal family living in Livorno in the 17th uh, century. Um, presumably um, that, that will be in the, uh, the new book on Kettlebot, which everyone uh, must buy. Um, and um, Roxana asks whether you know anything about the uh, the Fernandez uh, de Livorno family, presumably Fernandez family in Livorno. Um, again, maybe that's back to Alain Nedger's um, book, which uh, again everyone should buy. It's fabulous. I've, I've got my copy already. So. Yeah, I think I think all of the all, all of us in America, and I think even the Australians are still waiting for theirs because I know there's some Nunes yeah. cousins that I was talking to that about yesterday. <laughs> And and sorry, I've just heard from on, on Facebook Simon Vaz, who's part of the Jamaican uh, Jacob Nunez Vaz branch. Yep. So uh, if 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 uh, Simon, if you're not already part of the uh, the Facebook group, perhaps you should uh, you should join it. Yeah. Well, si actually, Simon just recently joined the group. Uh, he, oh, there uh, you go. Yeah. So, so I, I'm I'm very familiar with him, and uh, actually his his cousins uh, Shoshana Kent and uh, Paula Campbell, who are both uh, very very active. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I could brag about my cousins all day. I could go <laughs> on. <and> on. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was it for me uh, for now. Okay, um, Jared, do you want to? Go on to the next slide and, and perhaps Tom can. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Um, next week's meeting will be on the new book by Aviva Ben Hur, uh, which is named uh, Suriname Jewish Autonomy in the Slave Society. And uh, it's the Suriname society is a very special one in the sense that uh, Jews sometimes were the majority in the majority in that society. They outnumbered the other, uh, uh, the other uh, part of the, of the population that is of the white population. And they were um, allowed to have slaves, to allowed to have plant, plantations, and they were in, integral to the Suriname society. 
it promises uh, to be very uh, interesting, maybe a bit controversial, and uh, surely it will be confrontational because slavery is something that is um, a hot topic these days, although it's a long time in the past, but we still have to deal with the consequences and we still have to deal with uh, how to look at it. And um, Aviva Ben-Ur will do that and she will go beyond that. So promises to be good. Tune in, everyone. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, and um, just to really thank everyone for, for, for coming today because um, it, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a fabulous, it was a fabulous talk and it just shows what, what can be um, achieved. So, so thank you very much to, to Jarrett uh, for that. And thank you for everyone for being here. Um, if you do not already follow the Genie Blogger on, um, on uh, YouTube, then you, you really should. Um, and um, we um, are grateful for everyone who, who, who is here. We're extremely grateful for everybody who financially supports us through our, our, our Patreon group because it, uh, it, the, the, there are costs associated with, uh, mm. with, uh, with running this channel. And um, we, we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Um, just Jarrett and Ton, I, I forgot to say while we were talking off air, uh, let, let's have a, a, a break and then I'll, I'll, I'll message you both in, 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 in five minutes. Okay. So uh, many, many thanks to everybody and we look forward to seeing everybody um, hopefully next week. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jarrett. <laughs> Can Silence. you stop sharing, uh, Jared? I'll, um, I'll, 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 I'll close the meeting anyway. So, so, okay. Uh, okay. Well, that, thank you, everyone, and um, take care. Okay, bye.